cycles at the age of nine. 20 years later, he was world champion, having survived numerous crashes and injuries. His ascendancy to the championship last year began with the third placing in the Australian Grand Prix at Eastern Creek. He then won in Malaysia and finished second in Japan. It was then he strung together a remarkable tally of six straight Grand Prix victories, beginning in Spain and finishing in France. He clinched the world title when he won the 11th round in Czechoslovakia. The victory gave him an unbeatable lead of 87 points. There were just three races left in the series. Well, I owe a lot to a lot of people, especially Dr. Costa and, um, you know, the Italian people that helped me back in 92. Without them, I wouldn't be here. I wouldn't have a leg. He completed the year with nine wins and a top three podium finish in all 14 rounds, a feat not achieved since the great Agostini back in 1968. 1995 could certainly again be a year McDoan won't forget. He begins his championship defence with a brand new bike, launched recently on the Gold Coast. But it's still very early, uh, we haven't made any steps backwards, which is good, and uh, hopefully we're, we're building a motorcycle that's going to be uh, better than the rest. Well, Mick, uh, the winner of the Tour de France has that yellow jersey. The current world champion wears the number one on his bike. It must be a great feeling. Yeah, it's, it's certainly a great feeling to uh, have the number one plate, but uh, one that's going to be hard to keep, I'm sure. Plenty of pressure, sure, but uh, I get the feeling, having seen some interviews with you uh, and uh, read uh, about your build-up to 1995, that uh, things couldn't have gone better. Yeah, so far everything's been really good, um, but it's only the off-season. Hopefully we can have a good start to the year and uh, have a good year, but... Basically, um, all the improvements Honda have made to the bike have been a positive step forward and uh, also Michelin with the tyres, everything's been really good and uh, we, didn't, uh, we didn't put it off two wheels, so that was a plus as well. Mick, uh, you finished testing, I think, uh, Friday, so the bike just sits there now and waits for you. What do you do in the... In the we've got a fortnight to go before the big race. What do you do in the next uh, 14 days? Um, probably as little as possible with motorcycles, just... Uh, kick back a little bit here on the Gold Coast and just get ready for, um, for the Grand Prix on the 26th down in Sydney and, uh, and uh, just do as much as I can to mentally prepare myself for the, for the race. Do you get excited about it still? I mean, you've been around for a while now. Is it uh, like a new toy Christmas coming just a fortnight away? Uh, I guess not as, not as much as I used to, like when I first started uh, doing the Grand Prix, but... Um, I'm still looking forward to the start of the season and, uh, you know, itching to, to get the first one out of the way anyway. The first one always seems to be the icebreaker and, uh, and get into the season again. But, um, you know, I'm still, uh, I still really like to ride the bike and, and just get out there and, um, and race. So uh, I am really looking forward to the start of the season. What about physically? Uh, we saw an interview when you talked after winning the World Championship last year that, uh, you know, in 1992 you nearly lost a leg. I mean, have you got more flexibility? Do you feel you're fitter than you were last year even? Um, my fitness, I guess, um, is possibly a little bit better than it was last year. The f flexibility of the ankle is, uh, is pretty much none because... Um, the ankle is, is basically fused, but uh, I had an operation at, at the end of last season and, uh, and just moved the ankle into a better position. It was uh, like fused in a, about a 110 degree position, so I'd always land toes first. So we just cranked that up to 90. And, um, and so it's just a little bit more user friendly for walking around. And, uh, you know, that's made it a little bit better on the bike as well, but also walking back and, um, you know, to and from the bike's easier. Makes a difference, doesn't it? Do you think, can you be a better rider now than you were a couple of years ago? I mean, do, do great 500cc riders get better with experience or do you think they peak in their late 20s? Um, you know, I think uh, late 20s, early 30s is generally in the last few years always been the, the period for, for the world champions anyway. Um, there, there has been younger guys, but basically it's, it seems to be the more experience you got, you know, the the more you can use that to your advantage but um, you know I also still feel like I'm learning every time I get on the bike and uh, you know hopefully I will do for some time and uh, you know I can I can try and keep that edge there but uh, definitely every time I, I ride I feel like I'm getting better so hopefully that won't stop for a while otherwise I'll uh, 
you're looking for something else to do. What about the challenges this year, uh, Mick? I see Kevin Schwantz has had a not such a good build-up. Uh, he says this is going to be his last year. Where do you think the challenges for the world title come from? You know, what? It, it'll definitely be from uh, Kevin Swans. Um, uh, he's obviously started the, the pre-season testing um, injured. Um, he tested with us last week. I'm not sure how, um, how sore or injured he was. I'm, I'm not doubting that he had some sort of injury there. But, um, you know, Kevin will be the, the strongest guy week in, week out, um, regardless of what, he's, what his fitness is like. And then, of course, there's Daryl Beattie, um, the Australian guy, and uh, Luca Catalora, an Italian. And there'll be other guys, um, you know, on the odd occasion at their home Grand Prix or so, or what, whatever, um, we'll be given it 100%. But, uh, you know, there's only a couple of guys out there who are actually consistent over the whole 14 races, and uh, they're the guys I'm concerned about, like Swans and uh, Beattie and Catalora. The other guys, um, um, we, we've got to wait and see what they do at the beginning of the season and, and at the moment we can't, uh, we can't even imagine what they're going to do so we're going to have to keep our head down and uh, forget about the other guys, that's, that's all I um, do is, is do my own thing and if somebody's there to challenge, they're there to challenge and, uh, but uh, I just basically got to kind of keep my head down and uh, do the best I can. How many months of the year do you get a chance to come home and rest up on the Gold Coast? I mean after this race, uh... When will you be back in Australia after that? Probably be back um, probably late December, early January of 95, 95, uh, 96. So uh, uh, when we come back here and start our test program again for the 96 season, um, basically I'll be in Europe up until then. We'll probably test in, uh, in Europe while the weather's still half decent. And then we'll be back here to, uh, to start another test program sure. for another year. So it's nice to be home for a little while. It's good to come back here and catch up with some friends and family and so on and uh, get some good weather occasionally. Mick, on, on a sad note, uh, we do have a tribute later in the program to Greg Hansford. I'm not sure if you uh, knew him very well. He was a wonderful bike rider before he went to uh, motor car racing. It was a, a real tragedy last Sunday. Yeah, that was a shame, you know. I, I knew Greg. I didn't know him that well, but, uh, you know, we knew each other and uh, it was a shame. Another... Um, you know, uh, obviously a good car, car racer. He was a, a brilliant motorcycle racer. And um, it was just one of those freak things. And, uh, you know, I think everyone in motorsport in general was devastated by the accident. And, and Mick, is it something that you guys carry around with you? I mean, as some extra, extra baggage that in the back of your mind that something like this can happen? Well, you know, I think everyone, you know, obviously in motorsport, it, it's, it's probably a little bit more there than in general life, but I think everyone uh, realises that uh, the possibility of dying or being killed is, is, is there, whether you're just driving a motor car or on a bus. So, um, you know, I think motorsport is probably a safer form of, of motoring than any other form, even than public transport. And, uh, you know, it's, it's just one of those tragic things what happens occasionally. But I, I believe that... Uh, motor racing these days is getting safer and safer and uh, you know some things you just can't prevent and uh, it's the same as um, general day-to-day -day living and uh, you know it's a real shame but most people in motorsport um, obviously realize that that can happen and uh, it, it's something I guess you, you kind of try and put out of your mind but it's always there to, uh, to remind you Mick, uh, me, it, it is, uh, it's, it's a very sad thing for Hansford and uh, we do have to leave it there, unfortunately. Uh, and we do wish you well for the first race coming up in a fortnight. Yeah, thanks very much. Good on you, Mick Doohan.